The evidence is here. Our planet is indeed being visited by intelligences greater than man's. They travel in spaceships, in flying saucers. The evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles. In other words, some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. There are no good arguments against UFO reality, if we consult the evidence. Stanton T. Friedman, nuclear physicist and lecturer, has been consulting the evidence on UFOs for over 15 years. Uh, it was some, some kind of craft, you know, it was looked like it was going to come out onto the ground. But it, it came on down and hovered about, oh, about a foot and a half or, or two feet off of the ground. But we didn't know what to do, you know. I, uh, the river behind us and, and uh, that out there not knowing what it was so and then before we uh, had time to really do anything it seemed like an open appeared uh, toward the end it was you know toward us. and the blue light had it had blue flashing lights as it was you know approaching the ground but then they went out and when the opening appeared some source of light came from the inside it was just almost blinding at approximately 15 minutes to 10 Monday evening, several citizens from the East Los Angeles area phoned our station and stated that, that they were observing what they thought was an unidentified flying object. After receiving several of these phone calls, Officer Weinkoop and I were dispatched into the East Los Angeles area to investigate these possible sightings. We observed the object traveling in a southwesterly direction and gave pursuit of the object. While in pursuit, I was passenger officer and I was broadcasting a pursuit to my division watch commander, a Sergeant Tegroin of Hollenbeck Division, LAPD. During the pursuit, I managed to take one photograph. This photograph negative was booked into police property using this report and this uh, divisional record number. It did not have any dome like many of them have reported to have had. And uh, it seemed to be about 200 feet in diameter and about uh, 30 feet high. Well, it was more of a uh, feeling than either sound or uh, sight. It was one of these things that uh, there was an extremely strong presence in the house. And I got up, oh, I'd say it was 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and began to look around the house. Uh, I searched all the rooms expecting to find a burglar, but uh, there was no one, uh, no one in the house, but a uh, very, very strong presence. There doesn't seem to be much doubt that UFOs are happening, that they are real physical objects occupying both physical space and time. But the data also implies that UFOs may not actually fly here over vast, enormous distances, but simply materialize here, function as physical craft while in our atmosphere, and then dematerialize. Professor J. H. Bruning of the University of Mississippi has pointed out how closely a UFO experience resembles a psychic event. In both instances, something that, according to the rigid rules of science, shouldn't be there, appears and violates the known laws of space and time and gravity. Ghosts and UFOs seem to have a lot in common. Ghosts materialize, seem to float or hover above the ground, often communicate telepathically, then dematerialize just like the reports of UFOs and their crews. These and other fascinating phenomena such as time loss, teleportation, and spontaneous healing are all associated both with occult and UFO experiences. And I'm inclined to agree with astronomer Alan Hynek who suggested that we may be dealing with an intelligence that knows more about the physical world than we do, more about the psychic world, and is using it all. They had me uh, one on this arm like this, and on the other one, you know, they had my other arm like that. And they just, I just seemed to lift up to the same height they were off the ground, and, and we just moved into the crack. Now inside, how did they, how did they lay you out? Do you remember how it happened? Um, yes, uh, they, I didn't see any tables or chairs or anything in there. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't in there because the light was almost blinding, but I didn't see any. And when they, when they carried me inside, they seemed to, to just lean me back, you know. And uh, this, this eye, well, I keep referring to it as an eye, it, it moved up to, in front of me about this close. Mm -hmm. And it started right at my eyes, looking me right in the eye. Uh -huh. And it seemed to, it hesitated there for a, a, a few seconds. 
and it just started moving over my entire body. When they, they brought me uh, from the craft, that put along this area here, and they seemed to, they didn't drop me, you know, they just released me back to the ground. And uh, I fell, I, I don't know why my, my legs were weak, I don't know why it was a, the fright or what it was, but I, I fell onto the ground. And that's when I seen Calvin, he's standing right over here in this area, and he was standing facing the river with his arms outstretched like that, just like he was staring at something. Yes, uh, during the, my flight on Gemini 4 in 1965, I saw an object in space fairly close to our spacecraft that I could not identify. It looked to me like maybe the upper stage of another rocket. I tried to take some pictures of it, but unfortunately the, the pictures did not come out properly. Uh, we were never were able to identify what it was, and all of our ground radar tracking data indicated that there shouldn't have been another object anywhere near us at the time. General McDivitt, do you know anyone else who claims to have seen a UFO? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I know all kinds of people who claim to have seen them. Uh, some of them are very legitimate, and some of them, I think, are just having fun. Well, I, I kind of thought it was people at first, you know, off like that. But, of course, when they, when they appeared there in, in front of me, um, it was the most shock I've ever had in my life. They, they, were, they were shorter than me. I'd say about five foot two or three, and they didn't have a neck. They, they had, it seemed to come directly to their shoulders. And it had something uh, that, that came out to a point about where my nose would be, and, and on each side, the ears. And I believe that they looked like they were a little longer on the ears than the nose. But it seemed to me when they came out that doorway, or that opening or whatever it was, then just almost instantly, they were right there on us. Their arms, they had arms, and I saw the arms moving here and, and in the shoulders, but they had welved. I mean, their, their fingers were welved, and then they had something like a thumb, and they were like this. Mm -hmm. Soared into the news in this country in 1947, when pilot Kenneth Arnold saw nine disc-shaped objects skimming along at high speed and in an unconventional manner. Like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. A newspaper man who interviewed Arnold coined the term flying saucer, and over a quarter century of sky watching began. For 28 years, these metallic disc-shaped craft, tens of meters in diameter, have been seen around the world, from Paris to Papua to Pascagoula. Although science has failed to supply a generally accepted explanation of UFOs, Congressman, do you believe UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft? I, I hesitate in answering the question only because of this. I don't know, but my imagination tells me that perhaps, just perhaps, there is something that would permit a man to travel faster than light. Perhaps there is something that would permit an intelligent form of life from another planet revolving around another star to make that long trip. We see here the Montana 1950 film showing two bright objects taken by Nicholas Mariana of Great Falls, Montana. The natural phenomena that's often given as a source of these images is airplane reflections. Airplanes, unless moving at unrealistically high speeds, would have to be so close to the observer as to be identified as airplanes in order for them to portray the kind of motion seen on the film. I don't concede these images to be airplanes, airplane reflections, comets, or other well-understood natural phenomena. This film was taken in 1952 by Delbert Newhouse, a Navy photographer, near Tremonton, Utah. He estimated that there were approximately a dozen metallic objects shaped like two saucers, one inverted on top of the other. The official explanation was that the objects were a flock of soaring gulls. But Dr. Baker had this to say. Birds, such as gulls, simply don't make the kinds of accelerated turns at high speeds that were measured on the film. There also exists some meteorological data that would indicate that there were no updrafts that could have allowed the birds to maintain flight for long periods by simply spiraling. Does our military have in its possession the twisted metal remains of crashed UFOs, the charred bodies of space crewmen? I don't know. There are no easy answers, but one thing is clear. With the formidable resources at its disposal, the American military has to have the best collection of UFO data in the world. And I really think it's time they shared that data with the people. 
I must say I have some sympathy for the military, especially the Air Force, whose province is, after all, the wild blue yonder. What do you do when something unknown is penetrating your airspace and you can't cope with it? The bureaucratic solution seems to be, when in doubt, classify. But I also have real sympathy with the people who are the victims of this policy, people whose lives will never be the same because they had the courage to report what they saw. I admit some people have been seeing some pretty strange things lately. One of the strangest and most bizarre is the appearance of huge hairy creatures that walk upright on two legs and are frequently sighted in areas where UFO activity has been reported. Dr. Siegel, is it likely, in your opinion, that cloned man will become a reality in the near future? The very definite possibility exists that in the foreseeable future, it will be possible to clone the most complex mammal of all, man himself. I have seen UFOs, but in all of those news stories, I've detected one missing fact, one incredible, glaring omission. Not one world public agency or scientific group has even offered a partial solution to this most amazing mystery of all time. No public authority has told us who are the overlords of the UFO. And why are they here, right now, at this time? On July 31st, 1952, in the Italian Alps, north of Milan, engineer Gian Pietro Mongusi took these pictures of the landing of a UFO on the rough ice of the Churchin Glacier. The UFO landing was only three minutes in duration. A humanoid in some kind of space suit with equipment on his back emerged from the UFO, walked part way around it, and then re-entered. And Mongoosey had the pictures to prove it. The mental health of UFO observers was questioned. Another significant UFO picture shows not only the anti-gravity device operational, but also with it is a smaller degravitated sphere under the control of the alien intelligences of the UFO. UFO Quebec. Carried this sketch of a UFO humanoid crewman with a map of the star system in the vicinity of Zeta Reticuli, many light years away. Uh, I think every government in the world has three major problems along these lines with regard to UFOs. One, they'd like themselves to figure out how it works because it makes a great weapons delivery system. It makes anything worth flying look pretty naive by comparison. 
Two, you'd want to make sure that the other guy doesn't figure out how to duplicate their behavior because then you have a defense problem. If he's got something that flies like these things, we got a problem because we can't handle it. And three, perhaps most important, a kind of philosophical political problem, as soon as it becomes obvious to the people on the planet and widely accepted that flying saucers are real and from off the earth, there's going to be a push for a view of man as earthlings. The people on this planet, instead of I'm an American or Russian or Chinese, I'm an earthling. There is no government that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet as opposed to the country. Nobody wants to give up their power. And you know, all these jokes about take me to your leader, that's wishful thinking. What's funny about those is that there is no leader to be taken to. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. So there are enormous political problems with anybody saying, yes, there's somebody out there and he's coming here and he doesn't want to talk to me as a representative of the planet. We have received and recorded some 30,000 sightings since 1955. Have you noticed any particular patterns that develop in uh, pinpointing the UFO sightings on these maps? No, we have found no marked pattern, although we do believe that they are following two procedures. One, a surveillance of the land areas, a very close surveillance, and a close surveillance of the people, and it seems to fluctuate from one to the other. Now, through all these years of research, you must have drawn some conclusions about what they are, what the UFOs are. Well, we firmly believe that uh, what the people are seeing in those objects which we have classified as unknown are actually vehicles uh, not manufactured on this planet. How can you draw that conclusion? How do you know? Well, the vehicles have been seen in the United States, and there are good records of this uh, for the last 200 years, and actually the records go back into history for some 3,000 years. The same thing that were seen then are being seen today. He spent five days on a UFO, uh, he thinks. Now, there is some small time loss in there, but uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human-like, but they weren't human, and... Uh, he had quite an experience. He said he doesn't remember anything about a blue light in the first encounter last Wednesday. The blue light that they saw, he said, uh, at that instant, he got felt like he got hit in the forehead with a baseball bat, and it knocked him out. And he woke up. He was aboard one of the craft. And uh, they never spoke to him. They led him around by the hand. They wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to him. They showed him this and that. And uh, when they let him off, he woke up. Did he say they were friendly creatures? Smiled all the time, friendly, never harmed him. They don't. He, they were just as nice as they could be, but there was a total lack of communication, either verbal or mental. And he said that's what made him so upset, that he couldn't uh, speak with them. That's what, he was very, very disgusted about that, nervous, and uh, just plain disgust, the chance of a lifetime, and they wouldn't cooperate. So have the defense authorities of both nations. The UMO intelligences claim they come from what we know as Star System Wolf 424, some 14.6 light years from Earth, 90 trillion miles. Near their home planet, their UFO space travel device enters a black hole in space. A giant energy whirlpool vortex which hurls their spacecraft into another dimension in which time hardly exists. From this, they emerge into our dimension, into our solar system, and proceed to their expeditionary target, Earth. Later, the UMOs were to tell the European investigators that the universe was at least a ten-dimension unity. Perhaps even more, they were not certain. But they knew of and used at least ten dimensions of reality. Each reality was separate from each of the others. Each of the ten realities had its own rules of energy manipulation. Even though there were ten dimensions which were open to space travel, Reckless energy misuse in one dimension can disturb the cosmic unity of another dimension and its inhabitants. Telepathy is used to receive knowledge during space travel. 
The mind, said the Umos, in the quiet areas of space, is especially open to pure cosmic knowledge received by telepathy. Any mentality can receive and benefit from knowledge received by telepathy. The more telepathic ability is exercised, the more valuable it becomes, the Umos learned, as they learned many of the high scientific secrets of the solar systems they traveled through in their space exploration projects. Target Earth was to be another of their cosmic projects. The Umos first learned of the planet Earth with inhabitants of some intelligence in the Earth year 1950. They landed and left eight of their males and females in the area which had high mountains between France and Spain. Since that time, they have studied the new planet and the method of mental understanding used by its inhabitants. They found Earth science could not account for cosmic beings like themselves. They have carefully made themselves known to certain people of France and Spain, about 30 in all. They have tried to understand the limitations which exist in the mind of man. They find human knowledge inadequate and much inferior to the cosmic understanding, which permits space voyages between the Yumo position in the universe and the Earth. Let me tell you, I've never seen an extraterrestrial being in my life. I wish I will, and I know I will one day. You know, so maybe they're even around us, and we don't even know. Maybe they look like people, but I have seen UFOs. But other people, I'm sure if I'll ask who saw you for here, some of you will raise your hands up because they exist. I, I shot pictures, as a matter of fact, I had a fight with my publisher because I wanted to publish the picture of the UFOs that I took in, in the book and he said no because it's a cannabis, it will be against your credibility and I did it in the end because I'm not going to back away from the truth. I want to see... Uh, one minute. I want drove in the Sinai Desert. Do we have another minute? Yeah, go ahead. I once drove in the Sinai Desert, and believe me, with a, a high colonel and his driver, me and a doctor, and suddenly, in mid-air, in Sinai Desert, it's clear, it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we saw this huge object that looked like a cigar shape hanging in mid-air. And let me tell you, it was as big as three New York blocks, and it was dark. It didn't look like a flying saucer. It looked like a cigar shape. And I was shocked. And immediately, I, I get goosebumps when I talk about it. I told the driver, please, look what's going, look what, and the colonel. And you know what? They didn't see it. And they said, what are you looking at? I said, my God, can't you see that thing in the sky? They couldn't see it. So I think sometimes, what is really going on? Are they, is it really implanted in my mind? Is it really not out there and only, or is it there and only the people who believe in it can see it? I don't know. There are questions that I can't answer myself. A UFO. The UFO, exhibiting anti-gravity capabilities, follows the airliner right down to the surface of the Earth to its landing. The UFO is a bell-shaped type, which has been seen and photographed all over the world since the 1950s. From Australia to Western Europe to South Africa to Mount Palomar in California, where George Adamski made excellent still pictures, all with the same bell-shaped configuration sighted by a high energy level, caused the UFO to become immune to gravity. At this point, the UFO begins to take on a glow. At a higher state of excitation, it is ready to move into its home dimension, a dimension which is not light years away, but right here, interpenetrating our reality. A significant amount of scientific research evidence now seems to confirm the amazing fact that UFOs such as this are interdimensional spacecraft. UFOs can be blamed, says the University of Wyoming student newspaper. There is now striking evidence that the cause is not a configurated UFO spacecraft, but what is mistaken for a UFO is something just as new to science. Invisible flying predators which can be photographed with the aid of an ultraviolet filter 18A and ectocolor film. This was first accomplished by Trevor James Constable, a UFO researcher for a quarter of a century. 
Constable in Southern California builds equipment which gathers orgone energy or etheric or biological energy. Years ago, he noted that his energy gathering devices attracted invisible critters. He also photographed them at 35,000 feet through an ultraviolet filter near a commercial jet. They were invisible to the pilot. To my knowledge, uh, UFOs are not included in any of the training programs. We would, of course, provide instructions to our supervisors on how to handle reports of UFOs, but it's not included in the training of a controller. So I suppose the only way in which it would be included would be in, in I, I assume you admonish these people to be uh, aware of any unusual circumstance. That's right. And, and, uh, and make the pilots aware of what they're aware of. And to this extent, it would, would be included. But. This film at one half its original speed. This unidentified flying object was photographed by James Waters. Toward the middle of the extreme right of the frame, you'll see a second UFO that appears briefly. As we slow the film, you can see that the UFO appears to change shape from frame to frame. The object photograph was flying at a faster speed than any conventional jet fighter can achieve at this low altitude. Now you will see the Colorado film at its original speed five times in rapid succession. Now the section of the film where photographer Newhouse changed exposure. Weather conditions together with the persistence and motion of the formations eliminate the possibility of atmospheric mirages. Photogrammetric experiments have shown that the images cannot be associated with any kind of birds at any distance. Stop. Now forward again. Stop. We drop back to original perspective. Now once again, and for the last time, the Utah film. The objects cannot be associated with any known balloon observation.
they tried to describe it, but it moved at, at faster speeds than anything we had. We didn't have jet airplanes then. Later we measured one that was flying 7,000 miles an hour, measured it on radar. So these clearly exceeded any of our capabilities in 1940s, any capabilities of anybody in the world in 1947. On an average of about twice a month, I would get some kind of a UFO report, and they would see the circular craft, sometimes close, sometimes far, sometimes more than one. I remember uh, a crew describing one sitting on the, on the ice pack, and this is something we couldn't do. We didn't have any way to land up there, and they seemed to be operating in airspace without a visible support base. It took a fantastic base for us to maintain the B-29s, just to support them flying in the Arctic. I even had one crew describe one that they saw underwater that surfaced, rose off the water, and flew away. It happened one night when I was around 26 years old. It was 11 o'clock. I was going to bed earlier than what I wanted to be going to bed. And as I was going down to sleep, I thought, hmm, there's a blue light coming through the blinds. And I thought, I wonder what that is. And I just went to sleep immediately. I woke to, the, to my body vibrating as if I'd suck it in, a, in, a, in an outlet. And it happened about four different times in the morning on half hour intervals. I was being like what felt like electrocuted practically. And I finally, it, the last one finally stopped and I got up and I tried to shake it off and I, I just knew something really wrong, something just not right had happened to me. Six months into my experiences that included all sorts of really weird things, channeling, um, out of body experiences, I just was going berserk. What in the hell is happening to me? And I found myself stopping and um, looking at this being that was standing in my living room and um, saying, um, stop this, I hate this, um, get away from me. And the next thing I know, I found myself lying down on the couch and a white light hitting me in the forehead and feeling paralysis and uh, waking up um, the next morning and being uh, very afraid and very freaked out. and. Uh, somewhat traumatized, to use that word, and then telling Jamie. He was really upset. And actually, as I recall, that was the time that you, I thought you were crying. I mean, I felt like he was visibly shaken enough that there were tears in his eyes, and I had never seen him like that. Now you can open your eyes. And I almost wanted to pass that again. Here I am, my eyes finally open, and I can peripherally see my room around me in the ambient light. I always had light on in the house. I'm looking at this thing, and the first thing that I can get to even come to my mind is, Jesus Christ, you look like a fucking bug. Having had that experience and having it just mark me so, having, me, having it brand me like that, My life will never be the same. And just kind of going about, you know, our, our daily lives, going back to managing the hotel, and, and I think it was a few weeks later, it might have been two or three weeks later, it didn't seem like a, a, a long period of time, but within a few weeks' time, I remember lying in bed again and waking up, being startled, and feeling... Um, something uh, at the side of the bed and uh, being totally terrified and trying to wake Jamie up and Jamie couldn't wake up and feeling some kind of energy go into my lower spine and it felt like it was just sucking the life out of me and then passing out again and waking up in the morning uh, waking up with um, marks behind my ears uh, behind my my ear um, and again, being, visit, being very shaken emotionally about what my experience was the night before. Records still haven't surfaced. The Army tries to state that it was not an official organization effort to try to investigate UFOs, but it was, it was organized by a general. It bore fruit. It came to conclusions it was not popular, i.e. interplanetary spacecraft. And they continued to do exactly what they do today, and that is to be part of a multi-intelligent operation in the recovery of objects of unknown origin, particularly those that are of non-earthly origin, and to assess that information, get raw field intelligence data, and process that data 
into some type of useful intelligence product to disseminate to the field to those people who have a need to know and those people that are the, shall we say, the keepers of that information. In the 1950s, the United States Air Force had an elite unit to investigate UFOs outside of Blue Book, even though Blue Book thought that that unit was working with them, that they were not. This unit was initially organized as the 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squadron. Among its peacetime missions was uh, Operation Blue Fly. Operation Blue Fly was to recover uh, objects of unknown origin that fell to Earth. It's very important that you remember objects that fell to Earth because we didn't have any spacecraft up there at this time. Later it would be expanded in 1957 to cover all objects of unknown or, or all objects of unknown origin and it would become part of what they would call in the 19, 1957 October time frame uh, Project Moondust. In short, under Moondust, under Blue Fly, we have recovered alien debris, not of this earth. You have an airplane accident. We have standard procedures on how we handle that. Those same procedures are utilized when you do a recovery or extraction of a crashed spacecraft or debris thereof. And I have to stress debris simply because these are highly advanced technical machines. There were not that many crashes. They're flawable because they are made by an intelligence that is as mortal as you and I. Us being mortal, we are subject to error. Now the way you package the material, if it's just debris, is handled the same way you would if it was uh, hazardous material. You took precautions. If you had a whole craft, you took very serious precautions. Because while I still state they are not hostile, but you could cause some serious accidents which would result in death.